Hi everyone, welcome back to another TCE Talks. The subject of today's video is that of reading academic papers to give us a better understanding of trumpet playing. So we'll get into it after this. Okay, so the purpose really of this was was kind of to return to the story of me getting into the TCE and developing my understanding of trumpet playing. Um, because I, I think it's probably quite important, something I, I keep coming back to in my, in my mind when thinking about... Um, when thinking about all of this stuff really is... Is you know what? Are, how are we defining? How are we defining what is TCE? And I think it's just it's one of those things that, in many ways, there seems to be this this barrier to entry, which is that, you know, some people will just get a method book. Maybe it would be the Louis Maggio approach or something like that, and they'll practice the exercises out of it, and they'll get some benefit from doing so. Um, and then they move on. They, you know, essentially what we're doing here is we're learning to master the instrument so that we can play music. And this, um, their use of that book does not define them as a trumpet player. It doesn't define, it doesn't give them some sort of sense of identity. But somehow, because of the cult-like nature of, of, the, of Jerome Callet and his, his disciples and the TCE, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be that you get tarred with the callet brush, and from that point on, it's it's the only thing that matters about your um, approach to playing. And I've sort of felt this way almost from the beginning because I used to spend a lot of time on the Trumpet Herald forum because there is a dedicated Jerome Callet sub forum there. Now I haven't been on there regularly for many years. I've popped my head in every now and again i used to go in and just check the Calip forum and see if there were people asking questions but invariably even when i answered those questions i'd get people arguing with me even those from the Calip camp because i chose to use the wrong words i may have you know i i think that one time i i had said that um you know that you could relax the muscles of the face very much like lip flapping by doing some pedal tones as part of your warm up and it was misunderstood as me saying that that was the purpose of of trumpet yoga which i know not to be true and you know i think that anyone else that, that really had taken the time to you want know, whatever it's it, that's just what that play that website is like you can you can't have a civil conversation even with the people that you agree with so <laughs> This is the thing is that when I got into the TCE, I took it upon myself to go and confirm the things that I was being, uh, that I was learning. I was trying out this technique that sounded backwards to everything I'd always been taught um, and having amazing results and just going, well, it cannot be that Jerome Callet's the only person who ever figured this out. And so I started doing some research and you know, basically a lot of Googling and then reading academic papers. And, you know, I've come across all sorts of of, of papers out there and essays and especially sort of do doctoral, um, um, what would you call it? Uh, you know, dissertations and thesis, theses, theses. Uh, what's the plural of thesis? Um, and, you know, a lot of them are just regurgitating the same nonsense. It's like, oh, I read Claude Gordon's book and that's all the research that needs to be done. And so what I'm going to do is reword what he's concluded um, and, and pretend that I've actually uncovered something new. And there's an awful lot of that. I mean, well, the thing is as well is that I think, you know, we always fall into this trap with the academia where people are only at finding the things that their teachers already know you know their their lecturers have told them something or their teachers have told them something and rather than going out and finding more they go oh well this must be all there is my teacher knows more than i do anyway and so 
I, you know, I read a, I read a, uh, an academic paper all about pedal tones, and they didn't even, they didn't even discuss um, whether or not you should use one embouchure setting for playing pedals compared to multiple embouchure settings, and what the effect of that would be if you did. And so, um, it's like I, I read, I read one all about articulations, and it talked about. Um, anchor tonguing versus not anchor tonguing but it doesn't discuss where you anchor the tongue um, and these things were all written in a time when you know TCE is should be common knowledge by this point and and it's just not because every time somebody sort of brings the topic up they're shot down by people who know nothing about it who and um, and that's the end of the conversation is it just becomes all about uh, prowess and status and the fact that you work in some university that means that you are sort of some kind of gatekeeper to education which which is really sad because you know the the truth is that um you know it, this is a fairly new approach to playing at least in its complete form and there are an awful lot of professional players out there who who admit to tonguing on the teeth who admit to gripping their molars with the sides of their tongue um who admit to, I mean, there's. A, I put up the video myself where Maynard Ferguson talks about putting his tongue between his lips when he plays. And so, you know, we've got to, we've got to start taking this stuff on board and going, okay, you know, Jerome Callett might have, have started us on the path of realizing that none of the, none of the great players do what the books say. Um, you know, I th I, I've still, I still think that in the, in, the, in the academic sort of sense of things that TCE will never really be accepted in its complete form. But aspects of the technique have permeated modern teaching already. And it's just that nobody knows where these ideas come from. Anyway, I want to get, let's get things back on course. I refer to my notes. Let's have a look. Yeah, so this is the thing is that I started trying to find evidence of these ideas in other places, sources other than Jerome Callet. And primarily one of my concerns in the beginning was um, using less air because, you know, to many that's a big thing. You use more air is like the number one trumpet teaching instruction, which <laughs> I'm just setting myself off now and have all these uh, too much coffee, but... I had a conversation with a really uh, top player once who was who had posted on Instagram about how they wanted to find out more information about people's approaches to playing more efficiently. And so I'd written them a, a long email um, all about the TCE and how I learned to use less air. And obviously, the, in many ways, the definition of efficiency is putting less in and getting more out. Or maybe there isn't there aren't that many other ways of describing it. Some people would say it's the most efficient way to, to move more air. <laughs> but, you know, it's um, really, we're talking about putting in less and getting more out. And so I wrote them this long email all about the TCE and what I'd learned as a result of studying it and all of this. They didn't reply. And then a few a few um, months later, they, they had said that they went for a lesson with Hogan Hagenberger and basically all they learned in that lesson is that they should be using more air and I thought well what either somebody's not teaching or somebody's not listening because I know that that's you know he might think that that's how he plays but it certainly isn't you can hear that he's not a blower um, and that's you know sort of a topic that I hope to get into by the end of this video if I don't just ramble on for another half an hour without saying anything so yeah, it's it's really sad state of affairs that even some of the greatest players, you know, still are, are sort of pushing these stupid ideas. But I, I don't like I said, I honestly think that that actually um, maybe somebody wasn't listening or wasn't understanding because they're just seeing things through the lens of what they already know. So what I wanted to do with this video was basically just list a bunch of academic um I keep saying academic papers. I could just say essays. I could say articles. Um, you know, one of my, my sort of history in, in getting online with trumpet stuff is, is sort of rooted in writing blog posts. And so maybe articles is the best sort of um, term to use. But I just think that it's it's 
if for the sake of people doing their due diligence, they should everyone should be aware of of the information contained within these these articles, um, and maybe it will go a long way to us understanding that um, a lot of traditional ideas surrounding surrounding brass playing are a load of nonsense. So. Um, I wanted to confirm the idea that using less air is always better. There are sort of anecdotes about, you know, Jerome Callet teaching people that they should actually exhale before they play. And then that, and he would have them sort of do an AB test and demonstrate to themselves that they sound better when they have no air in them. Um, now, obviously this isn't an approach to playing. You can't, you cannot play music in that way, but you can, um, demonstrate to yourself by taking a huge breath and trying to play an eight bar melody and then taking a breath and letting it all out of your body so that you're essentially empty before then playing playing the same eight bar melody and i'm pretty confident that you'll find that your sound is cleaner and you have more control when you're not full of air uh, because you're not trying you, you don't have to control you know all of this all of the muscles that that become activated when you fill up, and you and you know, the fact that you actually get quite uncomfortable. I think that you know, in many ways, taking deep breaths feels good, uh, it, you know, just physically. And and many people just want to to feel that way when they play, but it's it's just completely unnecessary. So, this is one of the things that I'm trying to to get to the bottom of. And I was led to. First of all, I, I can remember just reading the Shilky Loyalist website, which I think is something like um, everythingtrumpet.com or, or something to that effect. I'll put all the links in the show notes. Um, and reading there that he talked about how um, he, I mean, in the in the past, we're talking like maybe 1950s or even 60s, where a long time ago he was t going around giving talks where he would have a tuba player fill their instrument with smoke something you couldn't really do in public these days, and then play on their instrument. And it would be more than a minute before that smoke emerged from the bell. And you've got to sort of ask yourself, well, if, if we're playing a brass instrument by just tanking loads of air through it, how is this possible? Because the same experiment works for a small instrument like a trumpet or cornet. Um, so yeah, it's not the flow of air through the instrument that affects, um, you know, that is creating the sound. And, um, you know, a lot of people, in many ways, this relates to instrument design, because you'll read a lot of marketing materials that talk about how having smooth internal, sh um, you know, air column shape, um, you know, lack of lack of overlapping tubes and this sort of business will, will result in a better playing instrument. And it's not really true because it's, you know, that's an airflow thing and it's not airflow that creates the sound, um, not in the way that people think about it. And so that's an interesting thing. And so if you go, if you just search online for Reynolds Sh Shilke Clinic or look at the Shilke Loyalist website, you'll find a discussion about that. Um, and then the next step up that ladder, the ne next level of understanding would be to find an article called You Don't Have to Blow to Make a Note by Dr. Richard Smith. Now he, he's the guy from Smith Watkins, um, who you know, he's done a lot of research into the internal resonance of, of tubing and, and all this sort of business. Um, but that article is the, is the one to read if you want to understand that, again, it's not, it's not the, the throughput of air that is creating sound. And so you know, we have to take a second to acknowledge that air needs to pass from one side of the lip to the other in order to, to set off the standing wave. And what happens inside of an instrument is not even the same as what I just demonstrated to you. But um, I think it goes a long way to supporting what Bob Civiletti once said to me, and that is that, you know, we should play the mouthpiece. Just play this just play this space inside there now that's an incredibly small space if you're thinking about buzzing enough just to fill the mouthpiece you take my artiste model that's even you know we're essentially not blowing at all to 
to create a compression wave in that space. The amount of air required to fill the mouthpiece is... <laughs> well, I can tell you it's like 0.005 um, cubic inches. Um, and what are you going to say? Per second, per second or something. Or whatever, you know, that's... Um, it, yeah, a smaller mouthpiece is going to take less impulse to create to set off the standing wave. And now that is, that is what leads us on to... Um, an article that once I got called out upon by, for, for mentioning, I don't remember which one of the three people who wrote it, it got in touch with me. It's, it's called More Air, Less Air, What is Air? by Jonathan Kruger, James McLean and Mark Kruger. One of them got in touch with me and said, you know, it would be really nice if you if you were going to go around quoting our work that you checked in with us to make sure you understood it first. Um Fair enough. I wasn't. I'm not really, you know, well versed upon the etiquette of quoting people's um, research, especially. This is probably the most academic, um, you know, sort of you academic paper as such relating to this topic. It's not just like you know saying what somebody wrote on their website. Um, so yeah, apologies for, for breaking that etiquette, but I then replied and asked whether what I had said was correct, and it turns out that I had had quoted it correctly and interpreted it in, in, a, in an accurate way. And the thing that's great about that article is that they mention something called onset pressure, which is the idea that, you know, if we want to hit a note at a certain pitch, at a certain dynamic, you need to create the um, air pressure um, appropriate to that before the release of the note. And that flies in the face of, of the, a lot of people's understanding of, of playing simply because, you know, they'll talk about air speed. And it's like, well, that you can't just start a note at an air speed without onset pressure. You have to preset the pressure. And that, that breaks a lot of people's thinking in terms of inhaling and exhaling in one go. Or, um, you know, it, in many ways, if, it, if all you think, if your only tool is airspeed, then it kind of means that all low notes are soft and all high notes are loud. And that's not how we play music. You know, you need to have some kind of involvement of, of airflow regulation, if you like, or air pressure, controlled air pressure release. And that's where the what's why the embouchure is important. It's why the tongue is important. Um, and the thing is, the truth is that the tongue controlled embouchure or super chops or true power trumpet fitness, however, whatever stupid name you want to give this system of playing. When we talk about spitting as a means of note production, excuse me. <clears throat> when we talk about spitting as a means of note production, that is the only method. That, that actually directly um, involves um, onset pressure. And that is that you set the pressure of, uh, of the air pressure in your mouth before you release the sound. Um, and, you know, that doesn't make it more right than another way to play. But it, what it does is it makes it a more accurate description of what we're actually doing. And when you're teaching people to, to play, having an accurate description of what you're doing is probably quite helpful. So um, that that article by Kruger, Kruger and McLean is, is really interesting because they go into all sorts of uh, talking about how um, what you do with your body, let's say creating air pressure and whatnot, um, when comparing a trumpet to a trombone is basically um, exactly the same, except that the result on the trombone is a sound that's an octave lower um, than on the trumpet. And it's talking about how producing notes at different, uh, different pitches up and down the harmonic series um, is always is always similar. I'm I'm really going to mess this up, so just please go and read it. It's really interesting stuff. But um, for me, their 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 discussion about um, how um, you know different schools of of brass playing um, 
you know, misinterpret the physical sensation of, of blowing air and how, um, you know, most people actually use less air than they think they do because they're, what they're feeling is to do with the, you know, the, the physical feedback of the, the standing wave and all this. Again, that's not in the article as such. Um, that's just me extrapolating on the information that it provides. So, yeah, very interesting. Go go read that. Go educate yourself about how brass instruments work. And then the last thing that I want to just to discuss and get out there um, is a very recent article from 2019. I'm not going to list who it's by, but if you type the following sentence into Google, then you'll find it. It's called Tongue Involvement in Embouchure Dystonia. Um, and it outlines an experiment that was done in which um, three professional players with embouchure dystonia um, were studied trying to play with an, MR with an MRI scan, observing what's going on in their mouth, and then compared to seven other um, players who don't have embouchure dystonia. And what they found is that... Um, uh, is that the three players with embouchure dystonia, all of them had lost the ability to direct airflow using the tongue. Now, what that what that teaches us is that um, that the tongue's involvement in in a good, healthy, functioning embouchure is paramount. It doesn't tell us that we should all be using TCE, but what it does tell us is that that the tongue is a part of the embouchure and its job is to focus the airstream at the lips. And now I'm going to say that the TCE is probably the only method that really teaches it in that way, using that choice of words. Because when people are talking about um, tongue level, what they believe is happening is, is or I'm not going to say that everybody out there teaching a certain idea believes it in a certain way. That's obviously not true. Um, but people talk, you know, the Claude Gordon book's got some thing about comparing the tongue to an air, to the wing of an airplane, which is obviously not true because that's to do with the, there has to be flow both above and below a wing of an airplane. So let's not get into that. Um, a lot of people really believe that it's all about the size of your mouth cavity. And I was just going to take a second to say yes, because Dizzy Gillespie, who has the biggest mouth cavity known of any trumpet player known, was really well known for his broad, dark tone, wasn't he? And his the fact that he struggled to play high notes. Oh, hang on a minute. None of that's true. So, um, you know, mouth cavity size has got nothing to do with it. It's all about air pressure. And it's about the difference in air pressure on either side of the vibrating uh, membrane. Um but yeah, so anyway, getting off track, that's the coffee speaking. Um, tongue involvement in embouchure dystonia is a really interesting article um, that, again, you know, just goes some way to confirming what we know to be true. Now, I think that when, when we come to talking about the difference that the TCE tongue position makes, um, it's about ease of playing, efficiency and control. Um and and yeah, you know, if we are reducing that space that the air has to travel through, then it's going to help um, somewhat to make us more efficient, but not in the way that people tend to understand it. So um, this was basically, let's just have a bit of a recap of me saying that in the beginning, when I first got into TCE, I was trying to confirm the things that I was um, that I was learning via sources other than Trumpet Herald <laughs> and and you know Jerome Callet's books and lessons and um, and simply you know you know in some many ways just trying to better understand what I was experiencing by pursuing this technique and I found that all the research that's being done out there confirms that um, the things that that Jerome Callet was teaching and that is that we should be using less air and that we should be using the, the tongue to, to direct that air at the lips um, and that it's about internal air compression or resistance to the air stream and not about air flow, um, all of this stuff. Now, I haven't really talked about the muscles of the face 
because I, I don't know specifically the names of the uh, or anything about the research that's been done into uh, the muscles of the face in regards to um, not tightening the mouth corners and you know this use of the chin muscles pushing upwards and the, the top lip pushing down and how it's basically the activation of the orbicularis oris. However, that has been confirmed by research. I know that it's in one of um, Pops McLaughlin's books. Uh, he had done some infrared um, tests with an infrared camera of the muscle activation of a trumpet player's face. And he found that basically the amateurs try to use their cheeks, their corners of their mouth, and actually that, that seasoned professionals don't do that at all. They use activation of the chin and, and these muscles here. It's all red around here and all blue and green around there because you're not using the, the corners and you're not using the cheeks to form an effective embouchure. And, and basically this all ties in exactly with the super chops material and the results of trumpet yoga. And so again, everything that Jerome Callick was saying has been proven to be true through through research, but it's not all been compiled into one method other than the TCE, which is universally criticized by, by those who don't know. And I'm going to put it that way because, you know, those who do know just tend to keep their mouths shut about it. So um, that's a thing. Um, there is, that's the, that Pops McLaughlin thing isn't the only study that's been done into that. I did see a video the other day in which um, his name escapes me. Oh, Greg Monks has dis has discussed this as well in one of his um, trumpet or brass playing myths videos, and he links to a, st a study um, that was done similarly with the infrared camera. And again, these aren't TCE people. This is this is the point: is that you know people end up playing correctly eventually despite the fact that they've been taught all the wrong things. And, um, you know, that's an interesting topic in itself, maybe one that I'll gather my thoughts on at some point. But, um, you know, he talked, Greg Monks in his video, he's, he's got a YouTube channel, go look it up. He talks about this same thing and essentially it is super chops. Um, it is what led to TCE and it's all still true. Um, and that is, we need to keep the corners of the mouth relaxed and we don't do this, this flattening the chin, tightening the top lip stuff that comes from all of our traditional teaching, the Philip Farkas and the, and all that. It's, I'm sorry, but it's just wrong. And we've, it's been proven to be wrong. It's just that the, the people that are out there teaching brass instruments haven't, are still kind of out of date. And and, and something that, that Greg Monks puts quite eloquent, eloquently that I'll, I'll repeat here is that a great player won't be held back by a bad embouchure. And I think that that tends to be the, the, the case is that, you know, people think that trumpet playing is a numbers game and that, you know, certain people will just be lucky. Um, and I kind of think that through practice, certain people will just not do what their teachers tell them and they'll have good results as a result. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's enough of me um, um, being controversial for one day. Um, I'm going to have August off. I'm actually going traveling for, for most of the month. And so um, I look forward to coming back and making more videos in September. Have a nice summer and um, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Bye for now.